Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar, Custom Base Map. First, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Tamara Grant, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Please feel free to ask any questions you may have through the questions panel during the presentation. After the speakers are finished presenting, we'll go ahead and have a short question and answer session. And then we'll wrap up the webinar with some quick announcements. This is being recorded, and it should be available by the beginning of next week. And you will be sent an email with a link to the recorded webinar. It can also be found on our Living Atlas space on GeoNet. We have a great presentation lined up for you today. But before we get started, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our speakers. First, we have Andrew Green. And Andy is the project manager for the base maps in the ArcGIS Living Atlas of the World. The vector tile layers and vector web maps allow us to publish updated base maps more rapidly than raster base maps. And vectors also allow our users to customize Esri base maps for their web maps and apps. And then, uh, we'll have Wesley Jones presenting. And Wes is a cartographer at Esri. He works on the base maps and a variety of other mapping projects. He just finished up work on the recently released cartography book. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and make Andy a presenter. And he should be able to go ahead and share his screen. We see your PowerPoint, so I'm going to go ahead and let you take it away. Thanks, Tamara. As Tamara said, I'm Andy Green. I'm here with Wes Jones, and we're going to talk about uh, vector-based maps and customizing vector-based maps. The outline of today's webinar will do an overview of the vector tiles, where to find Esri vector tiles, feedback for content within the base maps, what's new with vector tiles, and that includes both localization and the creative base map styles. And that'll be a good segue over to Wes's portion of the talk. Well, he'll talk about our style editor and the two components of that, the quick editor and the style layer editor. And he'll show a bunch of sample customizations, and then we'll finish this up with a Q&A and then we'll also continue that through our GeoNet space. One item to be aware of is that there is a PDF handout attached to this webinar that contains a whole bunch of reference links and URLs uh, to the items that you'll be seeing throughout our presentation. So make sure that you download that and you can use that as reference to a lot of the topics that we're talking about today. So what are vector tiles? Well, vector tiles are Esri's newest format for the base maps, and they contain a vector representation of data across a range of scales. They're rendered client-side based on a style file that are delivered with the vector tiles. That style is JSON format, and that's part of the resources, the map tiles, the styles, or the JSON file, the sprites, which are point symbols, such as road shield, as well as patterns, fonts, and then the map index. We have a number of different styles that all point to a single tile set. So while the contents of the map are the same across the different styles, it's actually that JSON style that's ren that helps render what the map is going to look like, whether that's the street map, the topo map, a canvas map, et cetera. So our vector tiles leverage several open source projects, including uh, based on the Mapbox vector tile spec. That's based on the Google protocol buffers, which uh, has the tiles in the PBF format. And styling the maps conform to the Mapbox GL style spec. With the indexing, it allows for a more aggressive overzooming, where the size of the tiles, the uh, dimensions 
are smaller where there's more detail within the map, as you can see in the image on the right. We can also create maps in any of the supported coordinate systems. Esri publishes a base map in Web Mercator Auxiliary Sphere, as well as WGS84 GCS coordinate systems. And while we do call them Esri's newest base maps, they have been available on ArcGIS.com since late 2016 for production use, and even about a year or so more than that, back to 2015, in beta format. So what are some of the benefits of using vector-based maps? Well, one benefit is the size of our VTPK. Compared with the raster-based maps, it's much, much smaller as the vector VTPK. It also allows us to do updates a lot more rapidly, and we only are publishing a single VTPK and then publishing the styles that all point to that single uh, tile package. The vector display is a lot better. You get the best possible resolution on uh, high definition displays. And it also allows for dynamic labeling, clearer, more readable text, and also on the fly labeling for heads up display. This graphic is uh, Explorer for ArcGIS. And if you were to rotate the vector map within the window, you can see that the text stays in a horizontal or an easy reading position from having it as a vector-based map. And then the map styling, which is the basis of this webinar today. The vector-based maps allow you to create many different styles and customize it to your needs. And it all comes from one single tile set for the contents of the map. Here are some examples of some of our creative styles all across one area of Spain. So where do you find the Esri Vector Base Map? One of the easiest places is through the Living Atlas of the World. You can browse the Base Map category, go to the Vector Tiles subcategory, and if you want, you can even constrain it to Esri-only content. And that'll bring up familiar base maps, both web maps and tile layers, such as the street canvas, mid-century modern, colored pencil, some of those creative ones. But they're all located in the living atlas of the world. We also have a vector base map group in ArcGIS.com. You can get to that group either searching through ArcGIS.com or, as I mentioned, download the handout attached to this webinar. It's a PDF and it does contain links to this vector base map group as well as a number of other features that we're going to be talking about today. And then through ArcGIS.com Map Viewer, when you go to Add, you can browse the Living Atlas and then there's additional filters where you can get to the categories, base map category, and then the vector tile subcategory. And the last one I'll talk about is Pro. In the catalog pane, through the portal tab, there's an icon. The last icon in that row is for the Living Atlas. And there it has similar categories, base maps, and similar subcategories, vector tiles. And then you can decide if you need the web map or, or a tile layer. For doing customizations, you will want to use the tile layer. Feedback. We have a vector base map feedback service on ArcGIS.com. It allows you to uh, report a problem or an issue with the content of the base map, such as incorrect name of a street, something like that. And you can uh, draw the area of the error, give a little bit of a description, and uh, submit that to our team. We'll review it. If we have any questions, we can reach out to you. But then we'll go through, update our data, and then identify when it's going to be updated in the base map. The link to that vector base map feedback service is also available in the PDF on this webinar. Next, we'll talk about localization. Right around UC, so a couple months ago, we released eight of the default gallery vector styles in six different languages. 
We have additional languages being released in the next few weeks. And we do have plans to roll out maps for all of the languages that ArcGIS.com supports. You can use the localized web map or the tile layer. And you can access these either through these groups or if you set your ArcGIS organization to the specific region and language, you can get the, vec the localized vector base maps as the default. So the six languages above the line on the left are the ones that have been released to date. These include uh, Chinese, French, German, Japanese, Russian, and Spanish. The ones below the line are ones that are planned to be released in the next few weeks. The translations of features on the map are across the globe, and they are primarily at the smaller scale, though we are updating and expanding the features and the level scale levels of what is being localized. Localization also includes the ability to customize boundaries and disputed or alternative names of different locations around the globe. This can be useful if you have regional preferences for depicting any disputed boundaries or names of features. We've cooked these alternatives into the single tile set that all the styles are referencing. You'll need to modify the JSON code to be able to expose these alternative names. We have a reference PDF on ArcGIS.com that talks about the structure of our ESRI vector base maps, as well as including a list of disputed labels with their dispute ID. This is just a sample. It's actually probably about a page and a half of different names that we do have cooked into the base map. So I'll show an example of the water body known as the Gulf or the Arabian Gulf or the Persian Gulf. In the top example, we have a code of 1120, which when put into the disputed label point for water bodies, will label this water body as the Gulf in the vector base map. You can customize the JSON and change that value to 4020 from the reference document code list, and that'll change the name to Arabian Gulf. Or you can change it to 4120, and that is the value that will expose the name Persian Gulf on your map. So using the reference document in conjunction with modifying the JSON on your custom style, it allows you to localize the base map to your purposes. In terms of map styling, Esri has a set of creative base maps. These also point to the single tile set, and it has the same map contents as maps such as topo map, street map, or canvas map but they've taken the cartography of the maps to the next level, really showing you how you can push the envelope of, of uh, mapping design. Our newest style released around UC is the charted territory. That's the one that's like a scholastic map with different colors for each of the admin polygons. And we also have the other styles that you may have seen, colored pencil, mid-century, Nova, human geography, newspaper, and we'll talk more about how you can style them and just uh, a little bit more about the style editor, and that's where Wes Jones will take over this webinar. Thank you, Andy. Let me just get set up here. Yeah, so what I want to do is I want to talk about the style editor and walk you through it so that you can use it more effectively yourself and so it won't be such a big learning curve for you um, when you start using it. But before I do that, I want to show you a few examples of some maps that I made with it. And these are 
uh, really vibrant maps just to showcase how you can go in such different looks when you use this editor. So here you can see I did a map and it's, it's a really blue looking map and it's based on the, the map I decided to start with because with all these designs uh, you start with the base map and then you can go from there and I start with the the actual the um, street map this design. Okay the next map this one you can see right away it's a dramatically different look it's got all these patterns in it and this one was based off of that colored pencil design so you can see right away within just two examples how you can go in a variety of different directions now the, the neat thing about these maps too is that um, I gave myself a limit of about three minutes to put them together and so they're all put together in about three minutes and I think I didn't use even more than about 10 clicks for each of these maps um, and I'll show you how I did that the next one which will melt your eyes a little bit with that water. It uh, uses the Charter Territory as its starting design. And you can see how it inherits those polygonal fills. So France is a different color than Germany and Poland, for example. You can see how it, where it started from, and you can take it in entirely different directions. Another quick example is this one. This starts with the newspaper design. You can see that I've gone for a really bright water and really dark land and it's unlike any of our other maps that we have. And the last example here, this one I want to show you is one that I actually got my kids to work on. They worked together on it which was quite fantastic and unusual but they did work on it together and they styled this map. One would choose one color for a category and then one would choose the next color. And they came up with uh, you know, a fairly interesting looking map and something that they both really were proud of at the end. Okay, let's get into the editor itself. How do you find it? The easiest way to find it, there's a couple ways, but for me the easiest way is if you go to the Living Atlas and in the search, if you type in vector, and way down here you could type vector editor, but the ArcGIS vector tile style editor. Click that, and it brings you to this page, and here it is here. So you just click this little item here, and you can go into the map. And I've got it open already in this tab, and you'll be welcomed with this screen. So the ArcGIS Vector Tile Style Editor, design your own custom styles for Esri vector base maps. Get started. So what I want to do is I want to walk you through this whole, this whole editor. And when you click Get Started, you're introduced to this window. And it says, select a style to start editing. So with all this vector base map editing, because it's, it's very, we're talking about base map editing, you need to start with the base map style. And we've tried to group these base maps into logical groupings for you so you can find that style you want um, the easiest. And why this is important is, let's say you really like the topo map, for example. Well, but you just don't like the color of the roads. This gives you the opportunity to use that topo map style and change the road colors. In, in this category here, we'll go through the categories. This is the popular category. This hosts most of our uh, let's call them core styles. So you've got the world topo map. Ones you're familiar with, the navigation, the street map. Um, there's a street map with relief and the canvas maps. Also has a couple of the localized um, languages in here. And you can take a look at each of them. If you click another one, like if I go to the world navigation map, for example, it'll show you what it looks like in this window here. So you, you can decide, and you can zoom in if you want. Uh, zoom in the skill, you can decide, well, is this the map that I want to start with or not? The next category is the creative category. Andy talked about this a little bit, but this hosts some of those Esri creative styles, like the colored pencil, the mid-century, the modern antique, the Nova, the newspaper, and the charter territory. Each of them is wildly different, but again, it's a great place to start. And if you really like, uh, let's go to this Nova design, for example. If you really like a lot of what's going in this Nova design, you can start there and then tweak a few things and you can have your own map. The next category is base. If you're familiar with their base maps, often we separate the base and the label or the reference portion of it. And this allows you to slip data in between. And some of the maps that do that still in the, in the vector, we have the canvases ones. So you, you, here you can see the canvas base and it will have its reference in this uh, next tab over here. And it allows you to work on uh, different portions. So if you just want to change the base colors, if you're happy with the reference, you can do that here, for example. And you can see the reference here. There's a few more reference layers because some of the maps, like the Human Geography, one of our custom creative styles, has a couple more um, reference portions to it. 
This one here that we're looking at is the hybrid reference layer. This is the one that works on top of the imagery, and I'll show you how that works, but you can just access this um, reference portion of it. The second to last tab has all the base maps in it. You can search through here, and if you're signed in, go to My Styles, and you can see um, any of your maps. So if you've saved a style and you want to go back to it, you can get to it from, from here. That's a blow through of all the tabs. We'll go back to popular, and let's click, let's just use the world street map. We'll start with that one, because that's one people are generally pretty familiar with. Now this is the editor. It's in beta, and you're greeted with this tab over here and a few windows. This main window over here is, is the one that you're generally going to be looking at the most to see your changes, but something to note that there's three windows at the bottom. Now, these are all live windows at the bottom, and what we found is when you change something in the maps, because these maps are really complicated, being able to see them change across scale is a really nice feature. And so you can zoom in anywhere in the world you want. If you focused in on Sydney, you could change Sydney to all these scales, and you can see those changes across scales. It's a really nice way to uh, edit these maps. Over here, I'll talk through some of this. This is the select a style. So if you want to go back to select a different style, you can use this button. This is the quick editor tab. The maps start with this. And I'm going to spend most of my time talking about this because a lot of those mass changes and I'd argue maybe 80, 90% of those really quick big changes that you want to make to a map um, will happen in this little tab. Um, there's this edit layer style. This, this allows you to get to the nitty gritties. It, looks like a TOC style, but you can get into any feature through this one. Edit by color is very powerful, especially in a map that's uh, simpler in the color scheme. So if you had a map that just had a few color grays in it, for example, like the canvas map, you could mass change those colors really quickly. You can save your map, of course. You can reset the style, which I'll show you. That's really nice if you've gone down the wrong path and you just want to start over, resetting the style. You can undo, redo, and you can, of course, leave a feedback on GeoNet. And if you start using this app and there's something that really doesn't make sense to you or you think there's an enhancement request, go to GeoNet and submit it there. OK. Now, I want to style a map with you really quickly using this quick editor. And I'll talk through these items a little bit. But generally, when you're styling a map, you want to change the colors and the labels. Those are two of the biggest things that you want to change. And those are your biggest bang for your buck. You can see that half of this window deals with color, and the other half deals with labels. Well, these maps are very complex. There's a lot going on with them. And to help you get over that hurdle of trying to understand it all, we've tried to group things into very logical groupings. So you can see we've got six categories here for the color. You've got land, which groups things like land and ice and urban areas, things like that. Um, there's water, there's roads, boundaries, buildings, and nature. We've grouped these. And if you wanted to change the land, for example, let's go into here. You just click the color, and you're greeted by this color pane. Now, you've got the option. You can stay in hex. You can move around here and enter values. You can type in your RGB if you want. Uh, you can do HSL. This is a great way if you are a corporation, for example, and you want to put in your corporate colors, you can just enter these into uh, really actually even over here. And it's a quick way to see if those colors will work with um, the style you're thinking about. OK, let's change this. Let's go down over. Let's just change this map ever so subtly to show you how actually even just a subtle change makes a big difference. One thing that I like, like about this is you can see all these colors next to each other. And this is really nice because you can see if those colors work well together, even visually, before you even apply it to the map. Let's apply these changes. So when you change the color, select Apply Colors. And the map will redraw with those land categories changing. And you can see that it's gone to that color, the, that darker color. And with one click, this map is a dramatically different looking map. It, uh, it looks nothing like the street map in a lot of ways. Next, let's change the water. Now, the water is interesting, and it showcases um, some some of the thought that we've tried to put into this, you can see that there's lakes, um, there's rivers, and there's the bathymetry. And if I click the water, and if I make this darker, we'll go, well, let's go even a little darker, and I say done and I apply it, I want you to take note of the bathymetry and how 
um, that the symmetry is treated by this color change. And you, what you'll notice here is that the water's changed. You can see the rivers and the lakes are this blue, but the bathymetry is still there. And so this is an important thing to point out that we figured that if you chose a style that had bathymetry in it, well, we're figuring even though you're changing the color, you don't want that bathymetry wiped out. You want that bathymetry still in there. And so we ramped it based on this color. And I think it does a really nice job of respecting that initial style, but um, giving the versatility of just only having to click one button. Rhodes does another similar thing. So let's change Rhodes to a darker color. Say done. And pay attention to it in the bottom three panes. What you'll notice here is that the roads um, change, obviously, but they still keep their casing. So we did the same thing as with the bathymetry, where we saw that there's association between the interior and the casing, and so we kept that logic there. This also showcases why it's nice to see this map across scales, because you can see, okay, at the largest scale, it looks like this. Uh, the medium scales and the small scales, you can determine if it look, works well or not, but it gives you a quick visual to see what you're doing. Boundaries, we could change those. I'll leave those right now. They, they work okay in the map. Um, let's change the building really quickly. I'll change those to a darker color. And let's take a look at them down in this bottom right-hand pane. And you see that they change. Now, the building has a shadow. Some of the styles have shadows. The shadow is respected as well. So again, we've tried to make things that worked in the initial style that you chose, tried to carry those over when you make those changes. That pretty much covers the colors in the quick editor portion. The next item is this recolor icons and patterns. I'm going to go back to this at the very end of it, but I'll tell you what this does right now. So the maps have a lot of icons in it, like this city icon here, and you can see road shield icons, and has patterns like swamp patterns. And what this does is it allows you to change the whole cue of those patterns to match the feature that they're associated with. And I'll show you what that means later, but for example, if I applied this, you have to be signed in to apply this, but if I signed in, this, instead of being white, would go closer to this background color. Well, we'll get back to that. Now, let's go into the labels. The labels, there's a few things you can do in this quick editor that are quite useful. And in this first one, it gives you the option to use selected colors or to pick label colors. We'll start with this use selected colors, and it relates to how much contrast you want in the labels. And I'll change it to a low contrast just to show what I mean. So I'll apply that. And what you'll notice is just try and remember what those labels look like. When you see these labels draw again, you'll see that across the map that they will have become pushed back to the background more. They become really lower contrasting. And I'll go all the way to the maximum, and we'll apply that. You can see how that these labels get pushed into that white and black realm. And this is a really nice way to, there's four options here, but there's quite a bit of variation between those options. It allows you to change that on aspect of the map really quickly. And it does another nice thing. It keeps it keeps, like if this is uppercase, it keeps it uppercase. If something's bold, it keeps it bold. It keeps all those other settings other than the colors. Now you, of course, can change the font across the map. And we have quite a few fonts that are available to you. There's some serif, there's some sans serif, there's some more script-like, there's some more fonts that have, um, you can see this one has a family of thin and thick. And we can just, I'll have you use this one. I'll select that one say done, and we'll apply that, and oops, we'll apply it over here instead, replace all, and you'll see that the fonts get changed across the entire map. Now, this font doesn't work very well at all. Partly, it's too small, and you could change the color, but you could also, because not each font is treated equally, you can make it larger. So if we click this larger button, all the fonts will become a little bit larger, and maybe it'll work better. Let's see what this looks like. It works a little bit better. I would say the halo is too strong. So one of the things you could do, if we go back to this label colors, you could pick label colors. And you can choose um, what you want the text label to look like. So we can make that black. Let's go down to black. And you can change the halo. We could, let's move it in that direction. Say done. We'll apply colors. Let's see what that looks like. 
And even if it doesn't look good, I'm not sure what this is going to look like, it just illustrates the fact that you can do these changes really quickly. And it looks okay. I, I know this is moving in the right direction. Now let's zoom in to New York to show this, this road width setting down here. Now here's a hint. If you shift select, you can zoom into an area much quicker than just scrolling through the, the scales. You can scroll through or you can shift collect, uh, select and it gets you through quicker. You can see these roads here. They're pretty thin. Down here, if you wanted to make those roads thicker, we've given you the ability to do that quickly. You could select this wider button. And it does it slowly, but it does it, and you can see that these are a little bit thicker, but it keeps the relationship between the roads intact. So all the roads are getting wider by a certain percentage. And if you do it one more time, you'll see that those minor roads are actually much thicker than they used to be. And again, it's a nice way to um, just tweak the map a little bit. Now let's zoom back out to uh, more of that world scale, and I'll talk about this randomized button at the top. It's one of my favorite things, um, probably in my top two in this app, because it really allows you to customize this map in an interesting way, it gives you lots of inspiration. Often I'm, I'm asked to make a new map and you're not necessarily sure, sure where you want to go with it. You can click this randomize button and it will randomize these colors. Now it randomizes it in the way that you're not sure what, water is not necessarily going to be blue. It's going to give you different colors, but there is some logic we tried to build in. So these colors you can see kind of work together. Now let's apply this and I'll go back to this, use selected colors and Medium contrast is good. Let's apply this and see what it looks like. And you'll see that we've got a very, very different looking map than we had before. It doesn't work great, um, but you could tweak it. You could say, oh, I kind of like that water. I just need to change the land. Or you could choose a different one. You could say, oh, let's go through. That one's maybe too pale. Oh, this one might look good. We can apply colors to that and see what the result is. And it sometimes gets you going in a way that you didn't necessarily think you were going to be going. So when this one redraws, I can see, oh, you know what, um, I could start with that. I kind of like how that water is looking. It goes across all the different styles. So let's select a style. I want to show you in the creative, if we go to the charted territories, because it's very different looking than the other ones, we'll select that style. We'll ask if you want to save. Um, I don't need to save. And uh, just give me one second. We'll apply those colors. Uh, we'll randomize the colors in that um, chart of territory style. So we'll let it draw. I could change a few other things here, but let's just choose these first uh, colors here. And we'll randomize it to see what the look is. Pull over to Europe and Africa. There's more countries here. Uh, let's just apply it and see what it looks like. And what you'll notice is it does, you know, Oh, actually, this one actually came out quite nice. Um, you could work with this one. I, I like the water. I like how the land works together. It, it's a really powerful tool. I, I, I really actually like playing with this one a lot. Okay. Let's go into looking at how you can get into more of the nitty-gritty, how you can really get in there to change some things. I'm going to select a style. I'll just select another one just to show um, that this works across all our styles. I was going to ask if I want to save again. I don't need to save. I'll re refresh that. And the style, this is the navigation style. And let's look, let's go north a little bit. I want to show you in this area, the Greenland, um, Greenland area. If you click this button, it opens up this new pane. And this data, like I mentioned a little bit, is quite complex. So again, we tried to group things in a way that was painless for you, or as painless as possible. So you've got a nat we've got categories. There's natural, there's water, populated places, land use, transportation, buildings, boundaries, and roads. Tried not to make too many categories, um, but enough that it was logical. What you can do is you can click into a category. You can see natural subdivided, there's land, vegetation, forest or parks, and special areas of interest. And if I click one more time, you'll never have to click more than this. We, we tried to limit the amount of times you had to really dig into something. You can see that land is subdivided into land not ice and ice. 
And you can see here that green then happens to be um, in that ice category. So when we click that, this pane comes up and it gives you the ability to change a lot of things. You could turn that feature off, for example, and you can see that Greenland will disappear in this map. Um, sometimes you don't want roads, for example, on a map, so you can just go into the roads and turn them off and turn that back on. Another nice thing you can do is you can change the scale at which that feature shows up. So right now it's showing at all scales, as you can see by this slider. And this little arrow tells you what scale you're at. And we're at the, the scale three right now. And if I go one past, you can see that green line will disappear in this map. And when I zoom in one scale, I'll just let this finish redrawing. When I zoom in one scale, you can see on the scale, Greenland reappears. This is really powerful because it allows you to um, push features back. So let's say you have roads in a map and you really don't want those roads showing up on that scale in this, in this navigation map, for example. Maybe these roads, this is just too crazy looking for you, um, but you like them down here. Well, you can find out what scale this is and push them back. Um, so it's a very nice functionality. You can obviously change the color of the feature. Um, add an outline color, add a pattern, change the opacity. Um, for this example, actually, let's change this to a, a red. Oh, let's change this to a, a dark blue. And we'll say done. And so Greenland will be this dark blue color. Actually, all the ice will be in the map. Now, what I want to show you here is that, that was getting into the specifics of one category. Everything has a parent-child relationship. These are the children and this is the parent. And if you click this parent category, the land category, you are given options that will impact everything below it. You can see here that this is the land color and it's, it's got land, not ice, and ice in here. So those are the categories underneath. And I can change the color. So I can change everything to whatever color that is and we'll apply colors. And you'll see that those changes happen to everything underneath. So I've changed all the land and ice below it. And we've done this because we wanted to make it as simple as possible for you to change things and quickly. And so you can drill in and get to the specifics, or you can say, well, these things are grouped in a, quite a natural way that I can work at this level. Or you can even go to the next level up. Anytime you've got this little area, you can go up to that level and work on it. Now there's more going on in this natural category. You can see it's got the vegetation and the forest and special areas of interest. It tells you all the features you're adjusting. It tells you what categories they're associated with. Um, according to that quick editor. You can change the label colors, um, how much contrast they have, the, the font, the sizes. So again, just trying to make it as versatile as possible for you. Okay. Well, what if you didn't like all the stuff you're doing? Well, let's just reset this style. This is a really nice way to get back to where you were. And you're like, oh no, I didn't mean to press that meant to press the undo button. Well, you can undo to go back to where you were before. Um, it's just worth mentioning these, these buttons because you can. It, it's uh, really nice to be able to reset to go back to the beginning and to undo to where you were before. So let's reset this. And we'll start um, with the default um, navigation map again. And I want to show you one of my... So I, the randomized button was one of my favorites. This is my other favorite thing, where this table of contents is pretty confusing. You can actually click on a feature, any feature in the map, and you can find out um, what it is, and you get to the attribute. So if I click on Canada, and I click on it, you can see that it's opened up. It's gone to boundaries, to country, down to the mega size. It's found this. It would be hard to find otherwise, um, just given the nature of the data. And it's opened up all the attributes for it. So you can click on any element. If we go over to Greenland, we knew that was that ice category. If I click on it, you can see that it's gone to ice and it's opened up those details. So this is a really good way to really explore the map and poke around. And you don't have to know everything, um, what it is anymore in the TOC point of view. You can just click on elements to find it. So we'll click on Canada to show you a couple of the other features. This is obviously text. And there's a lot of things you can do in the text. You can change on the size, the font, the color, the halo. By the end, you can do even some more specific things like change the casing, how wide it is, the line height. There's, there's a lot of things you can do down here. Uh, generally, I stay in this area, but once you really know what you're doing, you can go down to this bottom portion to change some of the text layout properties. But one thing I want to show you is 
how you can change something about um, this text element and how it works across scales. So right here, under text appearance, there's the size. And you can see that there's not just one single size. If you go to the little gear icon, you can either use, use a single value or set value by zoom level. And right now, it's a set by zoom level. So at zoom 2, it's going to be 10 point, 5, 15, 8, zoom 8, it's going to be 20. You can change this, and we'll make this really small to overemphasize the point that um, to work at any scale you want. So when you get to zoom 2, um, you, and you can see we're at 4, so it's going to be between these two, uh, the labels uh, become smaller. And we can go up to 50 on um, zoom level 8, and let's zoom in, and I'll show you how that label actually gets bigger across the scale. So it's actually gotten a little bit bigger here. Um, it's gotten much bigger. Zoom in again, it's gotten even bigger. So you, there's a ton of versatility and tons of things you can do here. You can also change the color. So let, let's change this to a blue, and we'll change this to a yellow just to show how the color can change across scale. We'll go over to here, and we'll say done. And we're at zoom level 7, so this applies from 6 and then all the way through 7, 8, 9, 10, all those scales. So when I zoom back to 6, you can see that it's blue. At 5, that color will transition. It's trying to get to yellow at this point. You can see it's changed a little bit. By the time I get to the next scale, you can see that it's moved much more in that yellow direction. Um, move one more scale, and it's almost yellow. And by the time I get one more scale, it'll be yellow. And let's make that bigger so that we can see it. And you'll see that Canada and all those other countries that are in this mega category will become really big and yellow. And so it's just, again, to showcase how you can make some of these changes, very specific changes, um, and quite quickly. I'm going to show you two more things. Let's go back into the select style. I want to go to the hybrid, the reference layer. Over here, we'll select that style. Of course, we'll ask if I want to save. I don't need to save. And let's just refresh that. So I want to show you how, if you're working with something like the, um, something like the reference layer for the hybrid, um, how you can at least get the imagery behind it. So down in the bottom here, you have the option to have no background. You can have a hill shade, or you can have imagery. So this one is associated with the um, imagery. And so if you turn that on, you'll be able to see how this, um, this layer works on top of the imagery. Uh, you could change the hill shade, for example, if you want. Like the topo map uses the hill shade underneath it. And so this is a nice way to be able to see that feature underneath. And you can see how this one happens to work with the hill shade. OK, last thing I want to show. Let's go back to, let's use the World Street Map style. We'll go back to that one. We'll select that style. And I want to show you how this recoloring icons and patterns work. And let's just choose a random style. I want one that's, uh, let's do one with this one where because it's uh, a little bit darker the colors. And let's apply that. And what you're going to notice is obviously all the colors are going to change like they did before. Um, and those icons haven't changed. And so you'll get, like, you can see over here how the, oh, this, this style is horrible. But you can see how that the icons are still bright white essentially, and say, pretend I like this. I could save it, and I'll sign in, and I'll sign in uh, with my username, Wesley Jones, and password, I think that worked. OK, and we'll call this 01. Make something that you can remember. And we'll save this cell. We'll just take a second to save it to your um, content. And we can go back. Let's just refresh that. Oh, I didn't need to refresh that. Um, it'll be here. Just one second, please. And then I'll, I'll know what it looks like when it shows up. Oh, yeah, there it is. OK. Now in the quick editor, I'll just let this redraw fully so you can see the effect. If I click the quick editor button, this toggle is now turned on. And this will, when I say apply colors, it'll change the sprites to try and match the feature they're associated with. Are there any down here? So let's apply it. Let's just see what it does to 
um, demonstrate it. It just takes a, style, a second to say this because it's actually changing that sprite sheet for you, so it's um, resaving it. And when it draws, you'll see that there wasn't a big change here, but these, these aren't white anymore. They've changed. And if you can remember before, these are actually closer color to the road than they were before. So things have subtly changed to work better with that style. And it's a great way to change those um, sprites and patterns without having to upload your own. And currently, you actually can't upload your own. That's something that's coming um, before Christmas for sure. You'll be able to upload your own sprites and icons. But it's a good way to start with a style that you like. Say you really like the shields in that one, and you really like a lot of other stuff. It allows you to change those features very quickly. Um, and I think that's all I'm going to do. I think I'm going to pass it back to Andy, and he's going to wrap it up, and then we're going to pass it to Tamara. So Andy. Great. Thanks, Wes. So on this screen now is the list of the references with the URLs for um, a lot of the topics that we covered here throughout the slides. Uh, has, the first one is the GeoNet page. Um, if we don't get to your questions, you can continue the question and answer on this GeoNet page. Uh, some links to the Living Atlas, to the vector base maps, the be vector base map group, the localization group, and the style editor that Wes displayed. Uh, and I did mention that there is a PDF handout attached to this webinar uh, with these links on it as well. So with that, I will uh, turn it over to Tamara and uh, see if we've gotten any questions. Great. Thank you, Andy. We did have a few questions come in during the presentation. If you have a question that you would like to ask and you haven't had a chance yet, go ahead and please utilize the questions panel to go ahead and type in your question. Um, the first question is, can you delete labels using the style editor? Um, so can you delete labels? Um, yes. You can choose to turn them off or change the scale that they show up, but if you wanted to delete a specific label itself, no, you cannot delete like one label, like say you want to get rid of um, Alberta, which you would never want to get rid of. But say you want to get rid of Alberta, you can't just get rid of that one label, no. Okay, great. Um, just I'm reading through ones that are coming in right now. Are users able to use custom base maps for applications that are already built? As long as, from what I believe, as long as the, the client that is, is being built for can uh, consume the vector base maps, uh, then the answer would be yes. Okay, thank you. Um, is there a way to change the coordinate system? For the uh, vector base maps, um, there is some ability to do projection on the fly in uh, Pro. Uh, and then we also have, uh, we actually publish two different coordinate systems. One is the Web Mercator and one is the um, WGS84 GCS, uh, but if you're looking for like a local projection uh, with our base maps, um, I think the best bet probably would be to, um, if you're able to use Pro and have it project on the fly. Okay, great, thank you. Um, is there any way to see the JSON file behind the configuration? Yes, um, that's a really good question. I'm going to go into uh, ArcGIS Online real quickly. Uh, actually, I'll go through Living Atlas of the World. I'll go to Base Maps and get rid of my search here. Go to Base Maps and then limit it to just the vector maps. And uh, we'll go with the layers. Okay, so I'm going into the world topo map. That's the Esri vector base map. And this is uh, one owned by Esri. So there is a view style button here uh, that you can open and look at the JSON. Don't be uh, scared of this JSON. 
recommendation would be uh, to copy this and use a JSON parser just as like JSON lint, J S O N L I N T dot com, and that'll uh, parse it into a more usable format. Um, but if you have your own tile layer uh, in your account, you can also, you'll get buttons that say download style. So you can download the root.json format, customize that, go in, you can do uh, edits in there in terms of color changes, um, font size changes, all manually through the code. You can do the localization with the disputed items like I showed you. Uh, save that out as a JSON, and then your own item uh, will also have an update button on this map item page. And with that update, you just reload your root.json file that you modified, uh, and then uh, that's the new style that's uh, attached to your uh, custom style. Okay, great. Thank you, Andy. I'm going to go ahead and um, take over the presentation ability so we can go ahead and wrap up the webinar. So I'd like to thank you for attending today's webinar and thank you to Andy and Wes for presenting. If you have any additional questions, um, maybe we didn't have time to get to your question. I know quite a few came through towards the end there. Um, we encourage you to go ahead and ask your question in our GeoNet group. If you go to GeoNet and just search ArcGIS Living Atlas, you'll find our Living Atlas space on GeoNet. Many attendees um, have had some of the same questions, so that way everyone can benefit from the answer. And um, don't forget to follow us on Twitter. Our handle is Living Atlas. The record Thing will be sent to you in a follow-up email probably around the beginning of next week and keep a lookout for the next webinar um, we're planning to host another webinar before the end of the year thank you again mm -hmm.